Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Pergo New Moon webinar of the 2025 initiative. My name is Alexander, and I'm happy to welcome you on behalf of the coordination group of the 2025 initiative. Today, in our work, we will focus on the sustainable development goal number 13, climate action. And we invite the energies of the sign of Virgo to lead this goal, making it more magnetic and attractive for people's minds and hearts all around the world. And as we prepare for this work, I invite everyone to join an alignment. So let's bring our focus within. Focusing in the heart center. Use the power of creative imagination to see yourself joining a group circle gathering on a mountain plateau where all of us gather together, projecting the light of own hearts to link our hearts together with the purpose of service, serving humanity in its path of evolution. And we project the radiance of our hearts into the group heart center. And here, in the group heart center, we stand as one group. United with light and love and will to good. And we project the radiance of our group heart upwards. Linking with the heart center of the spiritual hierarchy of the planet. The Christ. We realize ourselves being immersed 
into the radiance of the heart of Christ that touches hearts and minds of people everywhere in the world. And through his heart, we link with the entire group of world servers. Women and men of goodwill, serving in all the fields of human endeavors in all the countries around the world. linked together with intention of service to humanity. And we expand our group heart center, linking with the heart center of the new group of world servers. And as we identify ourselves with the heart center of the World Service Group, we sound the mantra. May the power of the one life pour through the group of all true service. May the love of the one soul characterize the lives of all who seek to aid the great ones. May I fulfill my part in the one work through self-forgetfulness, harmlessness, and right speech. Welcome to the Virgo New Moon webinar. This time of month, we all gather together to bring our minds and hearts to support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And today we focus on goal 13, climate action. And I invite Martha Gallagher to open the sharing today and bring our focus to this important goal. And as we continue our work today, we will invite uh, people from the audience share own impressions in a group circle. And at the end, we will come together in meditation to strengthen the thought form of sustainable development goal number 13. Marta. Thank you, Alex. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. How fortunate we are to meditate together on climate change in the very moment of the new moon in Virgo. 
we have together received and distributed so much healing energy in the light of the full moon. Let us take an in-breath of Virgo energy in the magic of this new moon. As we know, Virgo is an earth, Virgo is an earth sign. And we're told in esoteric astrology that Virgo is the incentive behind discipleship. It is the hidden light of God, the Christ in gestation, planted 2,000 years ago. In Virgo, the purpose for which form life exists begins to be realized. For some of us, that's the interior recognition of the actuality of the Christ being birthed in us in one soul on behalf of our healing in the context of Earth's. So let us turn our attention to healing in light of humanity's opportunity to forge our right relationship with Earth. Let us find Earth's sacred heartbeat now in gestation in us. We can experience the painful process Earth is demanding of us to find this organic relationship of Earth's heart in ourselves. With this process of climate change and all of the organizations and efforts around the world to respond to it, Mother Earth has joined the Me Too movement, as she says, no more, never again. Let us acknowledge as well, when we work together in triangles, we inevitably find Christ in the heart of them. So in a way, we might think about Virgo as an expression of the daily work that those of us who <clears throat> dedicate ourselves in triangle already are contributing to the rebirthing of Christ on earth in our hearts, in our group, and throughout the world. Healing begins in conscious connection with what is to be healed in rhythmic relation with the healer. Earth, in this context, may be seen as both healer and that which needs to be healed. We participate together in this process. At the same moment, we acknowledge our diseased relationship with Mother Earth when we look at all of the things <clears throat> that humans have perpetrated upon it. With regard to the work of the United Nations in respect to climate change, we note how Ray 4 works with the state parties all clashing with one another to maintain their sovereignty, <clears throat> a form of self-interest. Yet the underlying process of harmony flows in the persistent articulation of what is called for. And in this context as communicator, the UN may also be seen to be gestating a collective consciousness with regard to climate change that triumphs over denial and exploitation. The UN may be seen as a container that preserves and qualifies post-industrial human behavior, which has produced the planet's deterioration. It has kept alive the voices of Rachel Carson, of Gro Brundtland, and Wangari Mathai, who first observed and then communicated what was happening on Earth despite governmental attempts at suppression and persecution. The UN has held the line, however, and when it formed the United Nations Environment Program and later the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, both Nobel Prize winners, and followed up with two summits, one in Johannesburg in 2002 and then in 2012, which led to the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, 
Other voices, such as Vandana Shiva, continue to speak to both the moral and scientific implications of climate change. While all of us are active on the exoteric level to reverse the impacts of climate change according to our opportunity, we might pause to consider how we have changed and been changed in the last 50 years and how our local communities have changed in behavior and practice. It is evident that all these practices are expressions in discipleship and are literally moving us up the consciousness ladder as we hold our attention on the well-being of Earth. We may be called to a new demand. Can we maintain our loving relationship with Earth when forest fires rage and tear down our houses, or when heat seems to melt our pavements? Can we continue to see climate change as an evolutionary process, even in the moment we seek safety from the dangers. Birthing a child carries pain with it and feelings of unease. Imagine together us birthing a consciousness of comprehensive interrelatedness and interdependence in love with the earth, in love with our mother. We've reached the stage of inevitability. We can't get out of it. In right relationship, we can hold steady our love and trust, even in the space of what is taking place now. Can we see climate change as that of Virgo reaching through its opposite Pisces to bring to climax the Piscean impact? and begin the next stage of evolution into another time, another consciousness? Will humanity integrate, get itself together, or will it perish? Scientists no longer know for sure. We choose to believe humanity in some form will make it. The great climax of the Piscean form is said before. It will require all qualities and techniques of healing to achieve a proper response to these times. One that calls forth all of our skills together in a way that produces reciprocal benefit. Together, we can heal ourselves in the one soul when we seek to reestablish a wholesome relationship with Earth. We read in Esoteric Healing, the glory of life lies in consummation and in emergence. <clears throat> this is the prime task and the prime reward of all true healers. It is this technique of attraction and substitution which will be brought to a fine point of scientific expression in the coming new age. Let us hold our focus upon this 13th goal with all its targets and persistently continue to hold our intentions on where and how we see this in ourselves, in what is around us, and with the UN's persistent synthesizing life, the realities of climate change call forth. With regard to goal 13, it was included in the sustainable agenda <clears throat> near the close of the hearings uh, that took place, the intergovernmental panel of hearings that took place between 2014 and 15, because a rather highly elaborated framework had already been established through uh, a framework called the UN uh, Framework of 
for the Convention on Climate Change that was formed in 1992. And <clears throat> annual meetings had been held in collaboration with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to address governmental concerns, the changes that were taking place, the new actors that were stepping in to um, try to alleviate the condition. And it is a rather technical long process. It was not uh, seen as needed. And yet, with the pushback of the NGO community, the, the Goal 13 became established in order to highlight that in the sustainable development agenda, you have both an overview and you have large collectives of experts who are addressing uh, particular sectors of this agenda. The remarkable thing about this agenda is that despite the level of technical expertise that the various goals require, it is seen, the agenda itself is seen as indivisible and transformative. And so we may think that with these new moon um, meditations, we have the opportunity to think about the one goal that we focus on, and also to see the harmonic convergence that takes place in this great multiplicity. So let me turn this back to you, Alex, to invite uh, comments from our presenters at this point, uh, from our panelists, perhaps uh, I, I would invite Iris Spellings, who is the third part of our triangle in the presentation, if she would like to make uh, the first comment and elaboration. And then, Alex, perhaps you can help us include the, uh, those who are, are participating in this um, reflection. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Marta. And uh, um, Iris, if you want to join now. Otherwise, say um, hello. Yes. Hello. Hi, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, and thank you, Martha, and hello to everyone um, in the circle. It's a it's a joy to be participating. I learned so much in just doing this research on um, goal thirteen, and I wanted to um, bring out. Uh, a new report has come um, come before me. It's called Spotlight, and it is um, Spotlight on Sustainable Development. And you can access this. I think um, Alexander has it in the window now at www.2030spotlight.org. And it's an overall summary of by civil society of where we are standing now um, in 2018. They have been doing this uh, for the last three years. This is the third one. And the overall message that they're coming up with uh, for this one, as you can see, is in that first sentence, the world is off track in terms of achieving sustainable development and fundamental policy changes are necessary to unleash the transformative power potential of the SDGs. So, three years after this adoption, the governments have failed to turn this vision into real policies and in fact many countries are moving in the opposite direction. So this report focuses on the policies that are needed and as the authors underlined possible. There is a need for more coherent fiscal and regulatory policies and a whole of government approach that's a holistic approach towards sustainability. 
that the goals and the SDG shouldn't be hidden in the niche of environment and in development policies, but should be declared as a top priority by all heads of government. And the national strategies for this sustainable development should not be regarded as one among many, but constitute the overarching framework for all policies. So this is a 160 page report supported by a broad range of civil society organizations and trade unions. And it's informed by the experiences and reports of national and regional groups and coalitions from all parts of the world. So these contributions contribute um, and reflect on the rich geographic and cultural diversity of the authors. So along with um, the fact that the governments aren't doing enough is that civil society organizations have a key role to play as independent watchdogs holding the government and international organizations accountable. And we can all play a part in that. Um, this is particularly re relevant with regard to the richest and most powerful actors in the global system given their economic influence and political weight in international decision making. Like GAFA, I don't know whether you've heard of that, G-A-F-A-A, -A, that's Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and now the latest Chinese edition, Alibaba. And even I heard at the recent NGO conference uh, a week or so ago, the UN has to consider how we put a, put a place at the table for these uh, large global systems that are having so much influence and affecting the climate to such a great degree. So there's two uh, things I'd like to discuss now because obviously it is just a vast subject. One is the connection between the food health and environmental connection. And uh, the other one is climate justice. So uh, there are a whole range of severe health risks that are closely connected to the food system practices. And they're because people get sick because they work under unhealthy conditions, they get sick because of contaminants in the water, the soil, and the air. They get sick because of specific foods they eat that are unsafe for consumption, and because they have unhealthy diets, and because they can't access adequate and acceptable food all the time. But many of the severest impacts result from deliberate choices and trade-offs that have been made to promote low-cost commodity production in global food systems. And furthermore, the impacts um, of this on health are exasperated by factors like climate change, unsanitary conditions, and poverty, which themselves are driven by food and farming activities. So there's a whole range of health risks that are deeply intertwined with an ecological change and degrading this food health environmental system. First, food systems are a major driver of climate change. While estimates differ, food systems may account for as much as 30% of all human caused greenhouse gas emissions. Climate change in turn stands to aggravate a course, aggravate a series of health impacts. The changing climate may bring novel vectors into newly temperate climates, driving alterations in the incidence and distribution of pests, parasites, microbes, or create temperature related changes in these levels. The increase of diseases, especially from the animal kingdom. 
For example, people may be exposed to a greater accumulation of mercury in our seafood as a result of elevated sea temperatures. And new food safety risk could also emerge as a result of increasing floods and droughts. So in regard to climate uh, justice, uh, it, it's difficult. This is from an article by Tessa Khan, which is um, in the book Spotlight um, on Sustainable Development. And she says it's difficult to overstate the threat that climate change poses to sustainable development, equality, and the enjoyment of human rights. Climate change is also expected to amplify all the other threats, like we just said, of uh, the diseases and critical physical infrastructure. And we, you know, at the Paris Climate Agreement, um, the pledge was to uh, keep the average temperature to well below two degrees centigrade and to pursue these efforts to maintain the temperature increase to 1.5 centigrade above the pre-industrial levels. But the pledge that the governments have currently made to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions set us on a path to 3.2 centigrade rise in average temperature, which would mark a new catastrophic uh, reality in which the poorest and most marginalized countries, communities, and individuals suffer the worst impacts. And that would, uh, 3.2 centigrade rise would, would be equivalent to a 38 degree Fahrenheit rise in our average temperature in the world. And furthermore, neither the 2030 agenda or the Paris Agreement um, will hold have the mechanisms to hold governments accountable. So there again, it's up to us to uh, lend our voices, public opinion to this. But one of the new approaches to this is um, this enormous gap has spawned a national level litigation and although that's not new, however, in the last few years, there's been an increased number in the new generation of climate cases that seek to challenge the, the systemic climate change policy of governments. Among the most successful is a landmark case against the government of the Netherlands in 2015, which was brought by a Dutch uh, sustainability NGO and 900 individual plaintiffs um, and it led to the Hague District Court to order the government to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 20 for 25 percent compared to 1990 levels by 2020 and they declared the Dutch government's climate policy amounted to hazardous negligence so that was very successful. And then a few months later, a Pakistani farmer was successful in his argument before the Lahore High Court um, that the Pakistani government was not doing enough to address and adapt to the local impacts of climate change, which threatened the country's food and energy security. So since 2015, climate change cases that challenged the inadequacy of government Policies have been filed in countries like Belgium, Switzerland, New Zealand, UK, Norway, India, Colombia, and the US. And also litigation is increasingly used as a tool to enforce the responsibility of private sector actors, particularly the fossil fuel industry. So the volume of these cases can be expected to escalate in the coming years. Each year, the impacts are felt 
more widely and acutely, yet at the same time, our ability to attribute specific events and impacts to the cause of human activity in climate change is also becoming increasingly sophisticated. So we know that DK says that the power of public opinion, if tapped, educated public opinion, is um, one of our most useful tools. Anyway, thank you. I'll, I know I've gone on too long. I'll end here and uh, turn it back over to uh, you, Alexander. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. I want to add to this sharing that as we gather together um, today, we coincided in time with uh, Rosh Hashanah, the new year celebrated in uh, Jew among Jewish people. And this is a special time and time when everyone is called to go inward uh, in, in a period of introspection and repentance. And it reminded me of the uh, one of the labors that the great disciple Hercules um, did on his path uh, to perfection when uh, that happened during, in his Virgo cycle of activities. And he, I will remind you that at that time he was asked to go into far land to the uh, tribe of uh, warrior women and he was asked to bring the belt of the uh, queen or the princess of the uh, women warriors. And uh, she was aware of that, that she has to give it to him. And so she was prepared to give, uh, give that belt, that treasure's belt to Hercules as he approached, but he was so um, in fire of the his labor and so uh focused on achieving the the, the result that he killed uh, the the princess and just grabbing the the belt and only after realizing that she was giving it to him voluntarily and i think it's a very symbolic to the activity of humanity in general and uh, uh to each of us on our own level, that we separated ourselves on the path of development, our civilization separated itself from Mother Earth and from the feminine uh, aspect of being. And so we killing the nature, we killing environment to grab what we need for our own development at the best, but at worst, it's what we think we need just because of our greed. And I think it's all comes to, at the end of the day, comes to realization of own responsibility of the choices we make uh, in our everyday life. As Martha said, it's uh, Virgo is an expression of a daily work for rebirthing Christ. And it's in our everyday life, we come back to that inner Christ that is connected with Mother Nature and is not separate and only takes what is needed and gives it back to the world. And so it's, in a way, as I see climate action, it's a restoring the connect, connection with Mother Earth. It's restoring connectivity with the divine flow of energy. And as humanity goes through the first initiation, the note of responsibility becomes one of the most prevalent notes uh, on our time. It's realizing that our choices, our actions, make the difference and as we as meditators keep that in our focus 
that principle will be magnetized and will radiate out, outward to all those corporations and governments who make the decisions that at the end of the day make impact on the policies that can make a change and actually change the course of this um, catastrophic events that we have, we see start unfolding. I invite now others to share own thoughts and own impressions about how we can coming together, help the climate action. So please uh, just use the function, raise your hand on the control panel and we will unmute you or you can share your comments in, uh, in the uh, question section. Hello, Maria Cristina. Hello, Alex. Hello, everyone, fellow fragments of the one soul. Um, I, the opportunity to focus on this goal has been wonderful because I attended a very coherent and academic presentation on climate change yesterday presented by our scientific community. And what they had to offer, what the, the, the found such coherent, uh, coherency, a coherent approach that acknowledged and included and recognized the many organizations here in Tucson, um, I will say that even though the United States did not sign on to the Paris Accord, Tucson, Arizona and Pima County have signed on locally to the agreed to address the goals of the Paris Accord. And I'm sure that is true for many states and governments. And so that there is a much more integrated approach. What um, a board member from, and I, I'd really like to show the, share some resources because I was trained as a librarian. My, my career is as a librarian. So um, an incredible resource is the website Climates, Citizens Climate Lobby. One of its board members, uh, I'll quote, uh, global warming takes the most serious humanitarian issues confronting climate change today. Hunger, the food issues that Iris mentioned, poverty, clean water, injustice, refugees, and makes them worse. It underlies so much. Um, and they talked about the risks. But I would just like to mention that one of its offerings are timely topics uh, called laser talks laser talks and they have i mean they're from ted talks they're in a variety and they have them listed under climate science impacts policy policy design technology politics and international it is an incredible resource one of the talks um, that I watched was on global warming itself, and it was a very, what you need to know, the basic science of climate change in 24 easy steps as presented by scientists and what is actually going on, how it's being created, what is being created, very specific um, information. And lastly, I would share another talk I heard on how the fear of nuclear power is hurting the environment and how the 
cutbacks, for example, in Japan, closing down all nuclear sites and resorting to coal and so on, because it, it's the energy, the energy behind the food, the energy that is fueling all of our activities these days. Where do we garner this energy from? And this particular um, source of energy is addressed. How fear, nuclear power, um, as plants are being cut back even in Germany, even though they're going ahead in some positive ways, they're cutting back on the nuclear plants uh, has negated their positive steps. And I'm reminded of words from the Tibetan who mentioned the saving force is this very energy, and I'm here I'm quoting, which science has released into the world for the destruction, first of all, of much, I guess, I'm now claiming. But then he goes on to say that, or before that he says, I'm look, trying to find the quote, um, the keynote of the new age is apparently the liberate, related to the liberation of energy. This liberation has started by the release of an aspect of matter and the freeing of some of the soul forces within the atom. This has been a great and potent initiation for matter itself. And it is referred to by the Tibetan as a saving force. So I found that fascinating that there was an actual, again, laser talk on that issue. Again, I will try and share that information uh, because they're called laser talks and the, the talks are actually under a variety, like I said, they have them on policy, they have them on um, a variety of issues. And lastly, I would just add to Iris's mention on litigation that here in the United States, um, the youth are leading the way and actually have a lawsuit that has been making its way through the courts against um, the Trump administration. It's uh, against the administration by students their complaint asserts the government's affirmative action caused climate change has violated the youngest generational generation's constitutional right to life, liberty, and property. It is the Juliana versus the U.S. climate lawsuit, and you can find information on them under www.ourchildrenstrust.org. So I find great joy in seeing the young generation. These are kids in high schools that are stepping up. So thank you. Thank you, Christina. And I've shared in the ch chat window the link to the talks uh, that you mentioned. Uh, I think it's those that you shared earlier today with me, right? With yes, us. yes. Yeah. except so, the, the um, Children's Trust, I would also really, I find a source of joy to see that particular um, level of activism going on. Yeah, I will try to locate it now and share the group. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alex, if I may, this is Martha. Yes, Martha, of course. In this birthing process, it may be of merit to um, allow ourselves to recognize that in the process of governmental failure, we have an overriding failure in, in culture, <clears throat> which touches every sector of life, government, business, 
civil society, NGOs, families, and that's the for-profit motive. And that it, it you expressed it so well when you described the challenge of Hercules and he began in failure only to later triumph, that I see government very much like a Hercules. The challenges are absolutely overwhelming and the levels of uh, engagement outside government are extraordinary. So I would suggest to all of us at this new moon phase to do everything we can while we continue to see the problems and address them proactively and speak truth to power, that we also identify with the challenges that we're faced with and um, maybe work to eliminate from our vocabulary our, our perhaps an underlying attitude of anything that looks like we they. We are the government. We are the people. And I believe that it's so important when we deal with climate change to keep our focus as inclusive and as expansive as possible in the very moment that we support all this wonderful litigation. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Um, Dot, you wanted to share something and also I see a raised hand by Rebecca. Um, Daniela, my computer got frozen, so I cannot unmute Rebecca. If you please unmute her and please. Rebecca, you are unmuted. Thanks, Daniela. Yeah, thank you so much um, to think about. I wanted to share, we've had a, a, a good dose of DK quotes this morning, but I wanted to share something that I came across during the week and um, I just thought, wow, this fits with the climate change theme so much. And I feel like everything that's been talked about really fits with this little quote as well. Um, especially the importance of our subjective work um, and the whole um, theme that's coming through really strongly about polarities um, today, you know, the, the Virgo Pisces polarity, the, the um, polarisation that can happen between government and civil society, um, the, the polarisation between masculine and feminine and the need to reintegrate the feminine. Um, so, and and the quote also includes touches on economics, um, which um, Martha was just referring to in the profit motive, and just the the whole idea of the importance of integration, and also the importance of this work of um, subjectively creating a climate, uh, a mental um, thought climate. Um, and a heart climate that allows um, the, these goals to be received and seeded throughout humanity. So the quote is um, from Treatise on White Magic and it says that light and darkness interact as do pleasure and pain. Good and evil meet and form the playground of the gods and poverty and riches are offset one against the other. The entire modern economic situation is of an astral nature. It is the outcome of desire and the result of a certain selfish use of the forces of matter. Heat and cold, remembering that we're talking about global warming with climate change, heat and cold as we understand the term in a most peculiar manner are the result of the interplay of the pairs of opposites and an interesting line of occult study concerns itself with the effects of racial emotions on climatic conditions. We most truly make our climate in one significant sense. 
when desire has burnt itself out, planetary life comes to an end as climatic conditions will negate form life as we understand it. In relation to the human unit, the secret of liberation lies in the balancing of the forces and the equal, equilibrizing of the pairs of opposites. The path is the narrow line between these pairs which the aspirant finds and treads, turning neither to the right nor the left. And it goes on from there and that's on page 225 in Rule 7 of Treatise on um, White Magic. And I just thought it was such an interesting idea that um, astrality it creates climate and in terms of subjective work this this idea of um, becoming balanced and balancing polarities and stabilizing our astral natures um, seems like such an important um, contribution and so far reaching in terms of humanity as a whole and in terms of um, the work that we need to do in our relationships and our responses to each other and to bring in that that inclusiveness we need this this balance um, so yeah thank you it's a beautiful discussion thank you Rebecca Dot, did you want to share something? Thank you, Alexander, and thank you, Martha and Iris and Maria Cristina, Rebecca, for, for your sharings. I would just like to share two things. First, I'm so mindful, as everyone is sharing, of our dual opportunity on these webinars. And with the SDG New Moon webinars, as Iris was saying, uh, as we educate ourselves, we then lend our voices to public opinion and really as we're telling an Aquarian story. And at the same time, through our meditation work together and subjectively holding uh, all of this, we're building those thought forms. Uh, that as you were saying, Alexander, seed, and Martha, you just mentioned it also, seed things out here. So the second thing I, I just want to remind us that Virgo uh, has very much to do with the mother of the world. And Martha invited us to unite our hearts across distance and come into at one minute with the heartbeat of Mother Earth. And let us come into that same heartbeat uh, of unification with the mother of the world as this reset in Virgo today, which we're in the midst of right now, the exact exact moment uh, about an hour ago, it is bringing an integration of mind, body and spirit and all of the planets and most of the asteroids right now are in yin signs, earth or water, feminine signs. So as Martha asks the poignant question, can we see climate change as that of Virgo reaching through its opposite Pisces to bring to climax the Piscean impact and begin the next stage of evolution into another time, another consciousness? Astrologer Patricia Lyles shares with us that Neptune right now at 15 degrees retrograde in Pisces is opposite Virgo moon and we are working diligently at tidying up our karmic debts from the past that stand in the way of holding more reverence for spirit and more light of consciousness as we seek to create beautiful containers for spirit in the forms of our bodies our environments our thoughts through which we express the spirit of who we are in the in and on the physical plane and lest we forget, the very definition of health is a free flow of spirit through form. So I'm just really touched and mindful of all of that. And thank you. Thank you, Dot. We, um, this is really uh, interesting sharing and I, I, I would love us to continue it. Uh, though time-wise we, mm, close to the end already and is still meditation is important part of our work and 
So Iris will lead us in the meditation, but I still want to honor there are two more raised hands. And uh, I want to ask if you still want to share, please keep your hands up. If you don't, just use the same function of uh, lower your hand. And Daniela, if you could please operate it because my computer is still unfrozen, but I can't talk. Hello, Svetlana. You are on the group. Svetlana, would you like to share anything? Probably it was by mistake. Okay. Thank you, everyone. And I invite Iris to lead us now into meditation. Thank you, Alexander. I also wanted to uh, just bring up the fact that yesterday or today, depending on where we are in the world, um, the birth of Mary is being celebrated. And we think about Mary and we think about the mother of the world, um, especially with this goal, goal 13. So now we have the opportunity to work and we'll be using the meditation, the spiritual work of the United Nations and the liberation of humanity. Alignment. We stand within the center of consciousness of the new group of world servers as a group unity on the mental plane. We raise our consciousness to the hierarchy of the masters to the Christ, the master of all the masters, and to Shambhala, where the will of God is known, and wherein resides Sanat Kumara, the Lord of the world. At this high point of synthesis, we resolve. In the center of the will of God, I stand. Not shall deflect my will from his. I implement that will by love. I turn towards the field of service. I, the triangle divine, work out that will within the square and serve my fellow men. Higher interlude. While standing within the periphery of the great ashram, hold the consciousness open to the peaceful, silent will focused within Shambhala. Seek to become impressionable to divine purpose.
meditation. In complete focused silence, visualize the United Nations General Assembly overshadowed by the avatar of synthesis and infused by the love of the hierarchy and the Christ. Meditate on the purpose that seeks to guide the little wills of men. Precipitation. Visualize the perpetual flow of essential love throughout the planet as a constant, ever present permeation of all planes and states of planetary consciousness. See this energy electrifying, strengthening, and deepening. The planetary Antakarana, connecting the three planetary centers, Shambhala, Hierarchy, and Humanity. Lower interlude. In identification with the indwelling, the planetary and cosmic Christ life, ever pouring itself out in service to humanity and the planet, sound the affirmation of love with full dynamic intent. In the center of all love I stand, from that center, I, the soul, will outward move. From that center, I, the one who serves, will work. May the love of the divine self be shed abroad in my heart, through my group, and throughout the world.
consider the work of the United Nations as it relates to the spiritual welfare of the planet. Reflect on the needed planetary conditions that will help humanity fulfill its spiritual destiny and consider ways in which the United Nations can help create these conditions. Distribution. Sound the great invocation as a word of power and as an expression of the sound. Visualize the synthetic outpouring of light, love, and will to good throughout the planet, irradiating and infusing the consciousness of the whole human race. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into human minds. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into human hearts. May the coming one return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide all little human wills, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the human race, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth.
And as we together start the new cycle this month, we keep the flame of Christ within and flame of the World Service Group heart as we stand together in our service to the plan. Thanks to everyone for joining today. Thank you, Marta, Iris, and everyone for sharing. Please join our coming webinars. This month we have three different cycles coinciding, and so the next webinar will be Equinox Festival webinar on September 23rd. Nicholas Nealon will share his vision of the celestial foundation of the 10th seed groups. And on September 25th, we come together to celebrate the Libra Solar Festival together with Michael Linfield, who will bring our focus to the seed group of economists and financiers. And the next new moon webinar will be on October 9th. We will come together to bring our focus to the goal on industry, innovation and infrastructure. Thank you. Namaste. And Daniela, if you could please end the webinar. Okay. Goodbye, everyone.